such as bread as the body of uh, Christ. Uh, the differences in between uh, Old Testament and New Testament, and also similarities uh, in uh, the perception of uh, bread in both of these. Uh, also, Eucharistic miracles, as, as the as it's kind of in, the, in addition to bread as the body of Christ. Uh, and we'll focus on the miracle of Lanciano, which is uh, the oldest one, from what I know, uh, oldest known uh, Eucharistic miracle. Uh, and we'll talk about two saints, uh, Saint uh, Cyril of uh, Jerusalem. I think I misspelled his name. It should be Y in here. And uh, Saint Teresa of uh, Avila. Um, all right. So bread as the body of Christ. Uh, I think the first thing we should talk about is uh, transubstantiation. I hope I pronounced it right. Um, it's a very hard word. Um, which is pretty pretty simple and pretty. It's a very in, in important concept uh, of the Catholic faith. Um, bread is uh, during the transubstantiation turns into body of Christ. And wine turns into blood of Christ. Uh, but the thing is that the the change is only within the substance of the Eucharist of the of the the bread. Um, so the only the only thing that changes is the substance of bread, which is just basically flour and water, uh, turns into body of Christ, uh, and the uh, species, Eucharistic species, remain uh, unaltered, which means that the taste, smell, look uh, of bread and wine uh, remain unchanged. That's why we are able to uh, eat and drink uh, Christ's uh, body and blood, uh, because the, just the, the taste is unaffected for, with uh, the transubstantiation. And as I said, the only change uh, is within the, the substance of uh, of, the, of the bread, um, which brings us brings us to communion. Uh, and communion is a very, uh, I think, it's a very important thing, thing to talk about, um, especially nowadays when we can see a lot of um, what's the word. Um, I would say, like, not problems, but I can't find the other word now. Uh, with receiving it, uh, and, uh, the communion should be received, uh, in kneeling, uh, on tongue, uh, and any other form of receiving communion might be considered, uh, unholy or unworthy. Uh, or uh, just not just not proper, uh, and the reason why is because uh, when you receive communion, uh, the receiving communion on hand, I think that's the most controversial one, and I think it's uh, it should be talked about in church more. It should not be allowed. Uh, it's simply just. You have not only um, we we'll talk about it in the next point, but you not not only us humans, we are just uh, parishioners. We our hands are not blessed, and our hands are not prepared to hold the Eucharist. Our hands are not worthy of holding the body of Christ. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing, uh, we leave the, the communion. It leaves crumbs on our hands, and if if you touch, if anybody touches it, either if it's a priest or a or a, or a parishioner, then the crumbs remain on their fingers or on their hands, and if you drop them, it's dropping body of Christ. And thanks to transubstantiation, we know that the every piece of uh, Eucharist, every piece of Communion has body of Christ in it, which means every tiniest little crumb is body of Christ, 
and uh, just dropping it on the floor is basically just stepping on it. It's uh, it's evil. It's it's just it's terrible. And the the only thing that we should do about it is to uh, burn the floors every time it happens, just to make sure that um, the the body of Christ is not laying on the floor. And we are not stepping on it as Catholics or anybody at all because it's just disrespectful. It's insanely disrespectful. Um, and then the third point, lavabo. That's uh, um, that's the part in liturgy where the priest, at least in yeah, in both both uh, I think in Novus Ordo and also the traditional mass, uh, priest washes his fingers, his hands before touching the Eucharist. And it's a very important step before touching the Eucharist. It just it just shows the respect towards the the, the body of Christ. It shows that the 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 priest celebrating Mass knows that he is going to hold um holy uh holy Eucharist, holy uh, communion. He is going to hold the body of of God, and he washes his hands as a sign of respect, and also to wash. Probably symbolically, I would say that it's to also symbolize to wash the sins away from his hands, because he washes his hands with uh with uh the holy water. Um. And then the, I think the, another part that is very important to mention that I've noticed uh, that is sadly not present in Nobis Ordomas, or at least not the ones that I've been to recently, uh, after communion and after um, after touching the the host and everything, um, the priest of the Indian traditional mass, um, the altar boys pour wine and holy water on his fingers. So they don't have any crumbs left. So he does not spread the the crumbs uh, all, all over the place. Um, which it's it's beautiful because he washes his hands beforehand and then afterwards just to make sure that the body of Christ goes into the cup and he can just fully consume it and leave nothing behind somewhere on the floor or on the on the altar. Um, so, uh, yeah, by kneeling to communion, also come, come back to communion and wait to receive it. Kneeling to communion shows praise to God, shows that we respect Him, shows that, shows our humility, shows that we are uh, not worthy and we uh, we feel not worthy to receive His body, but we still ask for His we still ask for his uh, graces and for his help. And we still want to uh, receive his body and be part of, uh, we want to be in communion with him. Um, which standing up, which is another, and receiving a tongue is still, um, it's, it's kind of getting rid of that uh, humility aspect and also respect for, for God and for his, his body. But it's not as bad as receiving it on the hand. Um, going to New Testament, Old Testament and New Testament, I have a few um, few quotes from the Bible uh, I'd like to talk about. Um, so starting with the Old Testament, uh, which I'll read from uh, Exodus uh, chapter uh, 16, to verse 4. Then Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. Um, so I think here, uh, the very important part of, uh, of Catholicism and of the Bible is described and it's manna, uh, the bread of life. Um, showing that God provides and that we should not be worried about um, uh, whether or not we're going to eat 
um, that day or drink something because God will take care of us. And the only thing we have to do is to trust in him and show that we believe in him, we trust him, and we fully uh, submit our, ourselves to, to him. And it's, again, humility, showing the, the humility of, um, of us as human beings not being able to even take care of uh, themselves uh, and just relying on, on God. Uh, God's mercy. So here, bread is just shown as a as a bread of life, uh, keeping people alive, and also as a sign of trust uh, in God. Then Genesis, uh, Gen- Genesis uh, chapter three, uh, verse nineteen. Um, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for thus thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Um, this is what God told uh, Adam after he uh, sinned, after he disobeyed and uh, ate the apple, um, which was forbidden. Um, God told him that for now he has to work to eat and because he betrayed God's trust and he did not trust God enough, and he disobeyed him, he'll have to work for, uh, he'll have to work basically to to be able to eat, and also because he brought sin on people, uh, he also brought death. So in my opinion, bread in this this context is a sign of life as it's, as it's work and we have to work to survive and eat the bread (laughs) but also a sign of death as that sin brought uh, not only death but also uh, work on human beings and um, maybe that's a stretch and maybe that's a a misinterpretation on my side but what I think is kind of could be symbolic is that the grain, um, the grain that is used to make bread, wheat, is thrown in the ground and it grows from from the ground. And us humans were created also from uh, God created us from dust or ground. Um, I think it's kind of uh, symbolic uh, that. Um, The grain is power, it takes its, its power, the bread rises in the ground, which means that we are kind of like, I don't know what I'm trying to say, I think I'm, I'm lost. Uh, uh, but, but the grain basically uh, can symbolize us also as, as humans trying to, to grow from the ground and rise from the ground and uh, become the bread, just become more uh more than just uh just uh just wheat but we should we should just like i don't know what i'm trying to say <laughs> we should just try to basically uh be better and grow in virtues and graces um yeah and by by just work and by uh Trust, and you have to. We that's the only way we can get to to heaven. Uh, another uh, quote I have is from the first book of Kings, uh, and it'll be a little longer. Um, and it's about Elijah. Maybe some of you know. Um, then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached uh, Horeb, the mountain of God. It's, uh, this is a story about Elijah. Um, 
uh, that he was very tired after his first journey. He was uh, depressed, I would say, <laughs> uh, kind of sad. He did not have any power to travel anymore. He kind of gave up. But then God sent uh, an angel to give to feed him with uh, bread. Um, which bread sig- signifies here is it's life. It's, again, trusting in God. Um, manna from heaven. Uh, bread of life. Uh, God, God's nutrition for us. Um, and also that God helps us in a desperate time if we are, if we feel lonely and we feel, um, sad or depressed, we should just reach out to God and He's gonna give us maybe not an actual bread, but like nutrition. Our, we'll, uh, give some, some food for the soul. It's not only about, um, an actual substance, but also about the spirit, the, the, just the Spirit coming to us, the Holy Spirit, and helping us out uh, after we, we trust in Him. We pray, and we, we're humble. Um, and it's, again, a sign that the uh, bread, the manna from heaven, is the only thing that we need to, uh, in order to survive. Um, then in New Testament, is more there's of course there's more uh quotes that I could put in here and <clears throat> read them but it's um it would be a lot of them and it's impossible to mention all of the all of the quotes from the Bible that uh mention bread and so how important bread is in, in the Catholicism. Um so New Testament um in, uh, I'm going to read the uh, Gospel of uh, John, uh, chapter 6, verse uh, 36. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. It's again showing, um, uh, showing that um, the bread is significant and that the, the, the body of Christ that will be the the body of God later on, which that's the thing that uh, in Old Testament um, people didn't know uh, the bread would be later the body of Christ. Um, they just um, uh, they just uh, knew it as a sign of life and God's mercy on them. But in New Testament, we learn that. The bread is not only uh, nutrition and food provided by God in the most basic form, but also it's the body of Christ that will give our soul the eternal life. Uh, the thanks to it, we will be able to go to heaven. And if we um, that if we just trust in in God. Uh, and if we trust in Jesus and that Jesus' body is in us, then we will survive. I can't mention the names because I don't know them, but I, I know for a fact that there are saints that survived only off, uh, of eating uh, the Holy Eucharist. Uh, and they are fine. And it's just because they trusted in God and they loved Him so much that they, they knew that that's that's all they need. Um, next book is from Matthew uh, chapter 4 and verse 4. Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Um, here, I think there's just uh, showing that people probably took the, the word <laughs> that bread is uh, bread of life. That's again bring us to the, the idea of before Christ that bread is just a substance provided by God, and it's not exactly not only His word, and that we should that God will nourish only our bodies. But the truth is that um, God God's purpose, God's goal is just to nourish most most importantly our souls, and by listening to His word, that that's an actual um, nutrition 
for our soul, uh, we will be able to get to uh, heaven. Um, in this, uh, I think this, um, in this quote from the Bible, um, bread is shown as a worldly pleasure and that we should not trust only in the worldly pleasure and only in the, um, only in the, the, the food as well, as, as I said, the nutrition of the body, but we should put more significance and more focus towards uh, feeding our soul and trying to uh, nourish the soul with the word of God. Um, and then the letter of, uh, first letter uh, to Corinthians. Uh, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Um, so here we come back a little bit to uh, the communion. Um, we see that uh, when we we are unworthy and we if we receive communion uh, or blood of Christ in an unworthy manner, um, which we can also have two aspects of it: the, body, the the aspect of the body, an aspect of the soul. And if it comes to the body, it should be kneeling on the tongue, uh, as I explained before. Mm. And if it's otherwise, it can be potentially considered sinful. Uh, it also depends on the church's teachings, of course. But uh, in in this case. <laughs> Um, but the other thing is, according to uh, receiving communion on an ungodly matter, according to the soul. And now it can be, it can mean different things. One of them, uh, receiving a communion, uh, without any preparation. If we just get up and go, even though we, like, we, we were on the mass, we spent, uh, um, some time during the mass, we saw the consecration, everything, but we think about, something else. We don't think about the mass. We don't put any focus on the mass, in the mass. We just kind of get up and go and don't think about it. And it's like, oh, yeah, I just received communion so people wouldn't talk badly about me. Or just, oh, yeah, everybody does it. I'm going to do it too. That can be potentially considered sinful because, um, as I mentioned also before, priest prepared himself to receive a the, the body of Christ in many ways, not only prayers, but also washing his hands. And as his parishioners, should put some effort into preparing to receive the Eucharist too. So say some prayers, try to think about it, be grateful, be sorry for your sins. But if you don't do it, then maybe try not to get go to confession, not confession, to communion, uh, because you might not be worthy and you might be receive it in an ungodly manner. Um, the other thing, according to thought, might be uh, receiving communion in a state of mortal sin or uh, mostly just mortal sin. Uh, then we commit another mortal sin uh, and it's it's known that we, we when we receive communion, uh, in a state of mortal sin, you're more you that you just put more and more of those sins on your soul because it's just disrespecting um, Christ's body uh, even more. It's like inviting uh, inviting a very important person, like inviting a king to a to like a little but in the middle of the forest and there's a ton of dirt around and nothing is prepared and people are sleeping around. It's kind of like that. It's very, uh, very disrespectful. And uh, before we go to communion, we should think about uh, if we are worthy of receiving it, if we are not in a state of mortal sin, uh, we should do examine of conscience every single day um to be fair just to make sure that any time we receive the communion it's not um it's not simple and it's it's worthy and it's not ungodly 
Um, Eucharistic miracles are, um, they're very, um, not, there's not many of them, at least to my knowledge. I never, I didn't hear about a lot of them, but here you can see the picture of, um, the Eucharist found in, uh, Lenciano. Um, it's a little, uh, little village in, in uh, I believe, northern Italy. Um, the story behind it is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, so in, uh, it got discovered, actually, uh, in uh, around, like, uh, uh, 15th, uh, 16th century, actually. Uh, and it was not... As, as you can see, the first reports were in the 1574, um, and people are not certain about the date, which is interesting that the first mentions and first reports about the, such a big event in the Catholic Church date only to like 16th century. Um, so in uh, let's let's say that it was in in, in so we, we don't know exact date. It was between 730 and 750th. Um, so it all started with, uh, Leo III the, uh, Isarian, uh, that uh, issued an edict in 730, um, to, uh, there was a policy against religious images, and he, uh, declared that he wants every picture, every mosaic, every painting, everything to be destroyed. Um, so, uh, his servants, uh, went and started destroying all of these things. Um, there was a lot of fire. There was, uh, a few monks killed. Uh, uh, and many, many people, including monks, uh, took refuge in Italy. Um, now, the, uh, they were from Greece, so, they had a Byzantine right there. Um, uh, and they're Brazilian monks. Um, the, uh, so we assume that the monks celebrating that mass was, um, was a refuge from, from, uh, from Greece to, to Italy because of, because of the, the other, the Isorian. Um, he was a uh, hero monk. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly again. Or priest monk. And in Orthodox Church, it just means that it's a it's a monk that can uh, also celebrate mass. Um, he was a hero monk uh, celebrating a Roman rite, and then he, during the consecration, he had doubtful thoughts about. Uh, the presence, the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Um, and that's when the Eucharist turned into uh, flesh and blood, and, and the wine turned into blood. There were five globules of, of blood in, uh, in the cup. Um, he is uh, the, the unleavened bread, because the Eucharist is the unleavened bread. It turned into actual flesh, and the, the wine turned into actual blood. Um, they, uh, the, the relics were held by the Brazilian monks, uh, in, until 11th, uh, 75th, uh, and then they got, uh, succeeded by Benedictine monks in 1176, and they were placed in, uh, St. Francis, uh, church in, uh, I believe Lanciano, I think, in, in Italy. And uh, nowadays we can also uh, look at it and see the the globules of blood and also uh, the the Eucharist. In the picture here, you can see uh, how it looks. Kind of, I think it's uh, not a very good picture of it, but if you look it up on the internet, you can definitely see uh, more uh, pictures of of the Eucharist and the blood, which. Um, both of them were tested in 1970 for uh, authenticity, 
and uh, with the blood, they are not sure. I mean, it's blood, and they know it's blood, but they cannot confirm the blood type of Jesus uh, and compare it to the blood type of the, the globules found in uh, Lanciano. But the Eucharist, on the other hand, uh, is confirmed to be uh, a heart muscle tissue. So uh, that just shows us that that was probably true. The only weird thing is, of course, that it was not mentioned before uh, 1574. But still, though, um, that's a, that shows just the real presence of body of Christ and shows us the importance of being worthy of receiving his body. It just shows that we should be really, we should really watch out for how uh, and in what state we receive the communion. Uh, saint uh, Cyril of Jerusalem was a uh, early saint of the Catholic Church. Um, he was born in 313 and died in 386. Um, he was declared a doctor of the church in 1822. Uh, uh, and he was also bishop of Jerusalem. He was, uh, uh, he had valid, uh, everything was valid with, with, his, uh, with him. Um, he had some troubles with uh, Arius. Uh, and uh, other uh, bishops that uh, made him a, a priest, because they were also, uh, the one of them was also uh, the leader of Arianism, which if you don't know what Arianism is, it's a religion uh, assuming that uh, Jesus was not, uh, he was not um, uh, a god, he was created by God, the father, uh, and he was just a holy man, holy prophet. Uh, so he was just basically a normal human, but just uh, just uh, very holy and just like a prophet. Uh, and uh, Cyril did not agree with with that, and he wrote uh, many. Uh, he he wrote a book. Uh, that the name you can see over here is that uh, I can't pronounce it. I'm sorry. Uh, but basically, he wrote about Holy Sacrament to help people uh, understand um, what the Eucharist is and what the um, uh, what the Eucharist is, what the substance of the Eucharist, um, and how we should uh, perceive Jesus. So he wrote, the bread and wine of the Eucharist before the invocation of the Holy and Adorable Trinity were simply bread and wine. But after the invocation, the bread becomes the body of Christ and the wine becomes the blood of Christ. Uh, it's pretty simple and straightforward, uh, which is very uh, common for uh, St. Cyril. Uh, which is also, that's why he, he wrote the book in such manner. He just wanted people to understand better, and his uh, books are very clear, very uncomplicated, uh, and it's easy to understand what he's talking about. It's not a lot of philosophy or theology, and like Saint Thomas, you can just just read it and know what's going on in the book. So he's just talking basically about transubstantiation. Um, he was also uh, he also initiated the pilgrimages to Jerusalem uh, as a holy uh, holy uh, land, and he was teaching uh, uh, people that were preparing for uh, baptism, and also people that were after baptism uh, in the Easter time, uh, which just shows us why the readings are so simple because he was he was teaching us. Uh, pagans basically and they needed simple teachings to understand the uh the nature of uh transubstantiation transubstantiation and mm, other uh things in catholicism um but i read also that saint cyril was accused of heresy and he had a lot of trouble with the church and he was 
that he did not accept uh, that Jesus was in unity with God, which kind of I don't kind of believe that because reading what I just read, it shows that he he believed it for sure, but uh, apparently he was just. He just had a lot of trouble with uh, with the church at that time, and some people thought that he is uh, illicitly uh, and invalidly uh, um, uh, a bishop of Jerusalem. Um, and then uh, our second son is Saint Teresa of uh, Avila. Uh, she's also a doctor of the church. Uh, she was born in 15, uh, 1515. And died in 1582. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, she's also known as uh, Saint Teresa of Jesus uh, because of her deep devotion to Holy Sacrament and just Jesus Himself. Uh, she uh, was uh, fighting uh, against uh, uh, Protestantism, the Reformation. Uh, and she was trying to restore the Carmelite order's uh, spirituality. She was a uh, in Carmelite order. Um, she was trying to uh, write stuff to make sure that people know that Calvinism and um, Calvin and Luther were wrong in their ideas of um, of. The, the the nature of holy sacrament. Um, so that's why that's one of the things she wrote. Uh, Once after receiving communion, I was given understanding of, of how the Father receives within our soul the most holy body of Christ, and of how I know and have seen that these divine persons are present, and how pleasing to the Father this offering of His Son is, because He delights and rejoices with Him here. Let us say on earth. For his humanity is not present with us in the soul, but his divinity is. Thus, the humanity is so welcome and pleasing to the Father, and bestows on us so many favors. So, it just shows that um, Jesus was truly God and truly human. He was just not some prophet, or just not just uh, God. He was God and, and God and human. And thanks to his sacrifice, uh, we get the blessings as uh, humans on earth waiting to get to uh, hopefully heaven. Um, it just shows that in the Eucharist, not only Jesus is present, but also you can feel the presence of the Father and the Holy Spirit uh, being there and seeing it and just pouring their graces on us while we receive communion. Um, that's why it's also like a mystery of faith, how uh, the whole communion and Eucharist, with uh, how is it possible to be a body of our God and to affect us so much? If it looks, it looks like piece of bread, but it truly, it truly, if we truly believe, if we, if we are, if we truly trust in God, we can, See and notice those divine persons that they are present and they are with us anytime we're to communion. And the only thing is, we have to be willing to accept their. Uh, we have to be willing to accept their uh, graces. Now we're going to Judaism, which is pretty similar, uh, but at the same time, not really. Uh, I won't get too much into the uh, religious aspects because I am I not an expert and I don't really know too much about it. But um, there are a few interesting things to be said. Um, so symbolism, bread in Judaism, uh, different kinds of bread. It's going to be very simplified. I'm just going to show a few pictures um, and describe. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, each one of the of the breads uh, really shortly. And then um, religious and not religious significance of some kinds of bread, and we will mention matzah, uh, challah, uh, bagels, and bialis. Uh, and it will be a little bit of history involved. So, uh, starting with symbolism of bread in Judaism, we start with uh, shoe bread or shoe bread or bread of the presence. Uh, shoe bread symbolizes uh, it's, it's basically named for twelve loaves of bread 
that symbolized 12 tribes of Israel uh, that were shown in the temple. Um, it shows that God was a resource for Israel's life. Uh, it was also nourishment for people and thanksgiving to God. Uh, they would put the, the, the bread in the, in, in the temple on a special golden table. Uh, called in the west of the, the holy place, next to the holy of the holies. Um, and the bread would be, uh, arranged in two rows of six, which in the Bible, uh, they mention the bread of the arrangements, uh, and, uh, um, the, the Jews truly believe that the, the, the placement of the bread is significant to, uh, to just show the uh, the, the 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 order, um, they change the bread uh, every uh, Shabbat, uh, and uh, so every every Shabbat the the bread was fresh, and the priests or the the, the yeah the priests would eat uh, the displayed bread from from the golden table. Uh, and then they would put a fresh one, and the next week they would do the, the exactly the same uh, thing, which might symbolize the first kind of maybe like Eucharist too. Uh, that we uh, every it's not Shabbat, but every every Sunday uh, we also uh, gather together and uh, receive the body of Christ uh, that was prepared. Uh, either the mass before or uh, during the mass that we are you know, not the 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 host of course but like the communion itself. Sometimes they consecrate it during the the mass like before or um, or during the 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 mass we had, we would attend. Uh, origin of the hala uh, is very interesting. And uh, for a long time, I thought that it's just bread, but in fact, it's not. It's Jews call any bread hala, or used to call any bread hala, and it's a bread that any bread that was uh, sanctified in a certain way. They had a certain ritual to sanctify that bread, uh, and they would. The, the hala is basically a term for a, also a term for uh, for a piece. A little piece of dough uh, from the bread that was given to uh, the priest uh, as a as yeah as an offering. Uh, and nowadays they also practice something similar, uh, but instead they uh, put uh, they they give they get a piece of, of uh, dough and they either burn it uh, or keep it for some certain amount of time. And then uh, discard it. Uh, I don't know in what way. Probably just throw it out because it's moldy or something. Uh, but uh, they still practice the 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 hala thing as a piece of bread, as an offering to um, to the to to God, to the temple. Um, God's word more is more important than bread, and that's what Jews believe because they, uh, they they based their Torah, I believe, on the Old Testament, which means that the God is feeling, uh, feeding the, our souls. And uh, thanks to, to that, we have a special connection with him <laughs> um, because he sends us manna. He sends us raw ingredients. They are gifted to us. And from those raw ingredients, uh we can um uh we can uh make uh the bread which brings us to the point of the unleavened bread for passover uh why is it unleavened uh and the thing is that Jews believe that because we got the God gave us um raw ingredients um if we add yeast to the dough, uh, the dough is rising and it's somewhat into like it's uh, interacting with God's creation. It's interacting it. It's uh, it's some 
mm, it's an interaction with God's creation. We just put a factor that uh, changes those raw ingredients into kind of a living organism, I would say. Uh, and uh, we don't want to, the Jews don't want to do it. That's why they would eat matzah. Uh, matzah is a, <clears throat> is a thin, uh, it's like a flatbread, it's kind of like a cracker. And uh, uh, matzah has a huge significance uh, for Jews because uh, uh, Egyptians would serve them uh, matzah during their, uh, when they're enslaved. Um, and then they would serve it because there was a simple food. It's just water and flour. Uh, it was simple and also filling. Um, so it's, it's matzah is a symbol of bondage, but also emancipation. Um, so that's like for Passover, they, they're, they, they just celebrate. Um, usually it's the tent of Nis, uh, Nisan, I believe. I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm sorry. Uh, which is the, in the English calendar, it's March, um, like March, April ish time. They celebrate Passover as a sign of suffering, um, and, uh, freedom that they gained because of, uh, because God's heard them and uh that's why they eat matzah uh because they because they they because they celebrate the the uh, they celebrate their freedom that they got freed by god's mercy uh they want to just go back to the roots and uh eat matzah unleavened bread uh just to show the their respect so kinds of bread here, um, I don't know if, can you see my uh, cursor, like the mouse thing? Can you see what I'm pointing at? No, not really. Sweet. So the, this bread is, uh, this is challah. Uh, challah, uh, we mentioned it before, but now it's uh, it's uh, just braided bread. As you can see, it's braided. And it's supposed to have 12 humps. To, to to symbolize those twelve uh twelve loaves uh the as a shoe bread. Uh but yeah that's how how it looks like. It's usually uh pretty sweet. Um it's uh, yeasty. I think I made it once, it's pretty nice. Uh everybody likes it uh usually. Uh then we go to bagels. Um bagels are interesting uh thing. Because they uh, they are kind of Jewish, but not really Jewish at the same time. But uh, after reading a little bit of history, which I'll mention in a second, uh, bagels are definitely a Jewish uh, thing, and they um, they eat bagels on Sunday. That's like their little tradition to eat bagels on Sunday with some cream cheese or uh, smoked salmon. This one looks like a pancake, but it's not a pancake. It's uh, I hope I'm not, I don't know how to pronounce it. I'll just pronounce it with the Polish accent, so I'm very sorry. Uh, lahuch. <laughs> it's like a pancake, like, uh, Yemenite bread. Uh, but it gains its, uh, its bubbles here and the golden color here because it's not flipped. Uh, that's why the, it, when you, when you make it, it's important to keep the, mm, the pan, uh, temperature, uh, the like for hot and also the pan quality matters a lot, so they can turn out like this and not stick to to the pan. Um, they also taste different than pancakes, even though they look like pancakes. They're not pancakes exactly. Uh, but yeah, then we have uh, bialis, uh, or as we call them in Polish, uh, cebula. Uh, and they are pretty interesting, and this is something I didn't know even, and I, uh, I treat it as a really uh, nice uh, fun fact. It's a traditional uh, Ashkenazi pastry um, originating in Poland, and it's basically in the middle here. You can see it's uh, onions and poppy seed. Um, it's one of my favorites, uh, so uh, I'm kind of I'm surprised that I didn't know that it's Jewish before, but. Well, here it is. 
Uh, this one, this is Honey, by the way, is uh, Miss Leta, and it's uh, Moroccan, Moroccan Jews, uh, eaten at the end of Passover, um, and usually with honey. Uh, I know that some Orthodox Jews want to eat, some Jews eat uh, during the Passover, they eat matzah that is uh, stuffed with uh, something, with uh, like some vegetables or meat. Uh, but some Orthodox Jews uh, have the family tradition to be just plain matza with no toppings on it. So I think this, like at the end of Passover, it's kind of a treat, like a bread with honey. Uh, also, honey has a honey has a special symbolism in religion too. So that's why probably eat it at the end of Passover. Um, the next one, the cinnamon roll looking thing, is kubanek. And it's again, uh, Yemenite pull apart bread, uh, that usually is eaten for Shabbat, for breakfast, in, during Shabbat, uh, for breakfast. Uh, it looks like cinnamon rolls, and I would think they kind of like cinnamon rolls, but they are more tight and they look, uh, less yeasty, less doughy. Uh, they're more floury and, uh, kind of like croissants. Maybe you should try making them at some point. This is well known pita. Uh, and it's universal for many cultures uh, in the Middle uh, Middle East uh, and many religions too. Uh, it's most often eaten with uh, hummus. Uh, yeah, you just you see the pockets. You usually open the pockets and fill the the pita bread with uh, hummus or uh, some other stuff. And then this is our famous uh, matzah, the bread for uh, for Passover. Um, mm, looks like a cracker. It is kind of like a cracker. It's pretty tasty. Um, yeah, so this is just the, the bread that Jews eat during the Passover. And as I said, sometimes they put something in it or on it just to make it probably tastier. But I know that some... Orthodox G uh, families have their own family tradition to eat plain masa, uh, so they avoid any any feelings in it. Uh, so religious really analogy significance of kind of some of some kinds of bread. Um, masa, as we talked before, is a symbol of uh, <clears throat> tradition, bringing us back to Passover, uh, the the time of slavery, but also just uh, emancipation and freedom. From from the from the Egyptian uh, God's mercy, uh, Hala uh, is uh, um, the, the 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 twelve humps on the bread symbolize the uh, the twelve the true bread, but also uh, it's a little the piece of dough uh, as an offering to to the priest to the temple. Um, the interesting also about Jew thing is. Uh, Shister or Shister Hala. Uh, it's basically putting during the the first uh, Shabbat after the Passover, uh, some Jewish families would put a key in the the, the Shala uh, dough uh, that symbolizes just the the hopes for the the wealth and uh, the good luck. So it's kind of a, a funny thing, I would say. Uh, bagels. Uh, bagels have a very interesting history because they, not to get credits or, or anything, but they started in Poland. Uh, bagels started in Poland in 12th to 13th century because Jews were banned from uh, commercial baking. They were enemies of the church. They could not participate in uh, the, uh, the the bread culture of Poland as Catholics. Uh, they were banned because they uh, they were just disrespecting the body of Christ. And in 1264, uh, Polish prince uh, Bolesław the Pious he issued a decree allowing Jews to freely uh, buy, sell, and touch bread, which was very, it was a scandal back then. Uh, so many bishops uh, in, 20, uh, in 1267 uh, forbade to buy foodstuffs from Jews. 
because they just they couldn't believe that somebody would issue a decree like that because they were just not Catholic. Uh, and they would tell people, the bishops would tell people that Jews could put poison in their bread uh, to make them stop uh, buying stuff from them. So Jews were just allowed to basically boil uh, their bread or work with the boiled bread. Um, um, and that's how Lego was born. Um, so it's kind of like a funny, funny thing. It's kind of like a freedom from, freedom from, uh, being banned and also kind of like a weird unity with the Catholic Church as a taking part in that bread, uh, bread culture, bread, uh, bread, um, I don't know. Just basically, they, they were, they're finally kind of allowed to uh, relate to Catholics in some way, at, at least in the bread way. Um, and um, uh, it was also uh, a gift to women in childbirth, according to um, some uh, sources. Um, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's bread, it's, uh, nice and crispy, so, uh, I think it's a pretty good gift, uh, to, uh, after giving birth to a baby. Uh, and then we have Bialit, uh, and it's, uh, it's a pastry from, uh, it's not exactly pastry, it's savory, but it's pastry from Poland, uh, exactly, Białystok. uh, uh, it's, um, it also has an interesting story uh, to it. Uh, it came to uh, it actually came to America in 18th century, um, and sadly, it's uh, it, the popularity of it is uh, just decreasing. There's not many places where you can buy it. There's some places in New York, but that's about it. Um, it was uh, I was really shocked to to uh, to discover that it's uh, one of my favorite uh, pastries. Basically, yeast bun uh, with a hole inside, and they put cooked onion. Uh, probably making butter for it or something like that. Um, next is a plate of rolls by Vincent Van Gogh. Um, he was in Paris when he painted it. That's why there's baguette and a croissant here. Uh, sadly, the, the picture was better on the website, but I guess just the quality got destroyed. Um, he painted it in uh, 1887 in uh, Paris, as I mentioned before. And that's why we can see the, the baguette and the croissant. Uh, it's very Van gogh as of the, the col color palette. It's very yellow and green. He would paint with, with these two colors, but we don't see the, the swirls that are uh, more popular. I mean, he's well known from uh, painting the, the swirly pictures, so. 
And the detail of the painting, The Fasting of St. Charles by Daniel Crespi, uh, painted in 1625, um, it just shows that even though he was fasting, uh, he's still eating bread. Uh, bread and water, as you can see here. Um, he has a piece of bread here uh, and also on the plate. Uh, so even though he was fasting, he was still eating bread, which can, again, symbolize a bread of life and uh, God's nourishment to of humans. Uh, and as a fast, uh, our source of, of trust that God will just make us healthy and nourished only by uh, consuming bread and, uh, and water, just the most simple ingredients. Then mosaics. Uh, this one, the big one here, was found in a Roman house. It was a very bougie uh, Roman aristocrat house. Um, people are not sure if this is a loaf of bread or a platter. It might be either or. Um, uh, it was uh, made in between 100 and 200, a uh, year 100 and 200. Uh, and basically, uh, whatever it is, if we can assume it's a loaf of bread, because it has a color of loaf of bread and uh, the shape, shape of the, the loaf of bread, you see a little bit of a depth to it, too. Um, it was a sign of wealth and also hospitality um, that pe when people would get into the house, they would know that they would be fed and they would uh, have a feast. They would celebrate. These two, on the other hand, were found in a burnt church uh in israel i believe or somewhere in in that area um they're dated to be around made around fifth or sixth century we can see something that appears to be a basket of bread uh here are the breads the five loaves and three fish uh which uh you can see the loaves here too which is of course uh the sign of uh not sign the the analogy to the story in the bible about the bread, loaves of bread and fish. Um, all right. And then um, in Christianity, and you can see it in art uh, and also the writings, um, bread symbolizes life. It symbolizes uh, God, Christ's body, uh, and also, it's a God's gift for uh, for us, and just His mercy, His love uh, that He will provide. Uh, we have to just trust in Him. Uh, but in nation realm, on the other hand, as I mentioned before, it was a sign of wealth uh, that we can eat, we can feast, we can afford it. Uh, it was pleasure. Uh, it was uh, part of their. Um, as they said, feast. Bread was a, uh, for sure, a very simple food, but also very popular during the different uh, parties that they had. And they had uh, a lot of parties, especially when they were wealthy. Um, and it was just to fulfill their primal need to uh, be uh, satiated, to drink, to party, to just. Um, uh, just to be the, the, just to live with the instinct, basically. And in other cultural references, I would talk about sayings and social media. With sayings, I would just uh, mention a few, uh, a few, and I'll just read them. Uh, Panamans to the census, it's uh, Latin for bread and the circus games, which is a very popular exclamation. Um, in ancient times, uh, when people were just hungry for that primal need to see violence, because the circus games were, as, as, uh, I, I bet you know, as a reference to the gladiators and the fight, uh, and also Christians being eaten uh, by uh, lions. <laughs> um, and during those games, they would give them, give the people uh, bread, so they would be 
uh, full and they would still have energy to yell. Um, so basically, that's just, as I mentioned, it's just the fulfilling, the primal needs. Um, they just wanted to have fun and be full. Um, there is not a thing that is more positive than bread. Uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, uh, he was a Russian uh, writer. I would recommend a few of his books if somebody is interested afterwards. Um, there are more positive things than bread for sure, but uh, I think it's a pretty cute quote. Uh, that he was the Russian. It was time of poverty and um, bread was probably one of the most expensive items that you could get. And um, having a piece of bread was definitely uh, a joy. Avoid those who don't like bread and children. Swift proverb. That's my favorite, I think. Uh, just because um, as a person that loves bread, I would say it's kind of true. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you don't like children, then uh, we can see what, what are the kinds of people that don't like children. Um, they're scary. And then the one, the, um, the last one, uh, man cannot live by bread alone. He needs peanut butter. Uh, James A. Garf- uh, Garfield, uh, U.S. President. I think it's it's uh, it's funny because before we were talking about Catholicism and how important it is, and uh, uh, we cannot live by bread alone, as we should listen to uh, the Word of God and also um, nourish our souls. But he just completely changes the meaning of the whole uh, verse and. As the uh, bread is too little, we eat peanut butter with it to make it more tasty. Uh, and with social media, um, that would just be a little brief, a few brief things. Uh, trad wife trend, uh, or culture, or movement. It's a very popular thing nowadays to see um, all over the social media. There's just like different family channels, and all of the wives there, they make bread. And they usually make sourdough, which uh, sadly, I kind of am a part of it now. Uh, but anyways, they just base their, uh, their content around, um, promoting, um, the tribe wife kind of thing, which basically means traditional wife, which means stay at home mom, baking bread, uh, taking care of kids, having a lot of kids, uh, cooking, cleaning, and all sorts of stuff like that. And, um, I think it's sad that it's kind of like a part of the culture now or it's like a movement in the culture, or it's a trend even, because it's been like that for centuries, for ages, and I would think that it should be something that's considered normal and not kind of rebellious social media girl thingy uh, where um, you just try to be, uh, like, describe yourself as a trad wife instead of just being like, I'm a mom. And I am a housekeeper. Uh, I take care of, of of the house and the house's spirit. But instead, just that the fact that making bread and being um, that, like, let's say, quote unquote, perfect wife, uh, t- t- turned into like a competition, even. Uh, which mm, I'll talk about it later. But um, yeah, appreciation for tradition or is it pride? And I, I would say it depends if that trend of trad wife is appreciation for tradition or just being prideful and trying to show off to people, uh, show your life off, show how amazing of a, of a person you are, uh, how amazing of a family you have, how amazing you see your kids and how amazing when you just go through, uh, just the daily, uh, tasks just showing no no actual real life it's just not showing how actual uh there's no prayer involved um usually but there's no prayer involved um they don't really show the aspect of the of the real life um they don't show um how the actual real life looks like it's just all the perfect picture 
that makes may make people un, uh, like conscious about their um uh their own uh their own life their own uh, how they they uh how they um, <clears throat> how they provide for their own family but also how they keep their house uh and stuff which i think it's it's just wrong and mostly it's a prideful position when you um just put your whole family life in social media just to show off to people because it usually just looks like per- picture perfect thing and it's definitely not like that and blessing and a curse of the baker um there is a lot of competition involved in uh social media and sourdough baking and a blessing because you can see different recipes you can see the methods you can share with people or ask people uh that know more about tips and tricks but a curse because you want to compete with them at the same time and uh, i struggle with it too and um i think i'm just learning that it just it just it just takes it all takes time and um the only thing is just not to to give up and not to also not to give up to those um social media trend kind of <laughs> ideas and just to um trust in god uh be uh yourself and because as Catholics as a Catholic family, uh we know best what's what's most important for um for the kids and for uh for our souls and for their souls most importantly. Um but yeah, that would be about it. Thank you. Sorry.